Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Brian Keane, online fitness coach, nutritionist, and three-time best-selling author here to help you by deconstructing expert guests in all things health, fitness, and mindset. Today's guest focuses heavily on the mindset side of things. Coot Blackson on the magic of surrender, freeing yourself from ego, and finding the courage to let go. Very similar to previous podcast episodes with the likes of Marble Katz, Gabby Bernstein, Dr. John Martini, Robin Sharma, we go outside the world of fitness and health to a degree and focus heavily on mindset in today's episode. Some of you will be familiar with Coot's work from his Instagram page. He has over 270,000 followers on his Instagram page and is one of the world's leading speakers in the area of personal development. Today's podcast, we jump around on so many different topics and it's one that If it connects with you, you're going to probably want to save and listen to it two or three more times. I know I'll definitely be doing that. We talk about self-sabotaging patterns, the power of your conditioning and trying to get out of your own way, uh, external love, validation and approval and how to remove yourself from its power, why we struggle so much to surrender, why ego is not the enemy, but if you don't bring awareness to it, it can be amongst other things. There's so much hard hitting, enlightening and awareness based moments in today's podcast. As I said, it's one of these episodes that if you connect with it, I would highly recommend you go back and listen to it a few times because it's potentially going to change your life. If it doesn't connect, then it's one of those that may not be for you right now and come back to it at a later date. Again, as Marcus really has said, the same man never walks into the same river twice, meaning that your life will be in a different position and you might not be in the place to accept the information that's in it today. Thankfully, I was and had a great conversation back and forth and was able to ask some questions that I hadn't planned on asking and covered some topics I hadn't planned on doing beforehand. So without further ado, here's Coot Blackson on the magic of surrender, freeing yourself from ego and finding the courage to let go. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am delighted to be joined today with my guest, Coot Blackson. Coot is a transformational truth teacher and national best-selling author of You Are The One and now his new book, The Magic of Surrender, Finding the Courage to Let Go, which is a life-changing book that teaches you how to harness the power of surrender to live your highest purpose. Coot was the winner of the 2019 Unity New Thought Walden Award and is widely considered a next-generation leader in the field of personal development. His mission is simple, to awaken and inspire people across the planet to access inner freedom, live authentically, and fulfill their true life's purpose. He is also the host of the thought-provoking podcast, Soul Talk, with Coot Blackson that focuses on what really matters in life. I'm looking forward to talking all things magic of surrender, freeing yourself from ego, and the courage to let go in today's show. Coot, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Coot, I want to jump straight in. You did a recent podcast on how to free yourself from ego, and this is also the first chapter and around the first chapter on how to get out of your own way, ego, in the magic of in, in your latest book. Talk to us about getting out of your own way and freeing yourself from ego. I think that'll give us a really nice jumping off point for today's podcast. Yeah, getting I think, you know, when we can get ourselves out of our, so many of us we are constantly getting in our own way and blocking ourselves and you know, we feel so much potential, but something isn't fully expressing. We feel so much love, but sometimes we get into relationships and we're not, we aren't able to fully express that love. And, you know, we allow self-sabotaging patterns to get in our way. We uh climbing the ladder towards our purpose and success, and then we somehow sabotage and screw it up. And so, you know, we're often taught in the spiritual field, like you got to Ego is the, is the enemy and it's ego that has to be killed and annihilated and gotten rid of and you have to just, just extinguish the ego. And, you know, I think that the more we understand what ego is, the more we can have a relationship, a right relationship with ego, the more we can free ourselves from it. And I think the way we tend to have gone about trying to free ourselves from ego is actually reinforcing ego and keeping us stuck. And so, you know, ego really is the sense of what we perceive ourselves to be, our identified sense of self, me, you know, Brian, Coot, and the degree to which we identify and hold onto name, form, body, experiences, memories, traumas, you know, history from the past, the degree to which we hold onto that is ego. And so, 
what I like to say is ego isn't a thing. Like, like here's an iPhone and here's a watch, right? But ego isn't a thing. Ego is a process. It's really a process of identification, a process of holding on. And it's like a bicycle is a thing and the pedaling is a process. So when we can understand, oh, it's not the static thing, your relationship with yourself, because we think, oh, this is what I am, like it's a thing. But what we are really is a set of patterns or what we identify ourselves to be is a set of patterns. And the more we identify, it seems to be a thing which then makes it more static. And then we end up being limited by ego, limited by our sense of identification. And so when we realize that we are not or what we perceive ourselves to be is not so much a static thing, then our relationship with ourselves or what we perceive ourselves to be changes then we realize that we have the fluidity and the ability to shift, to let go, to transform ourselves. And so the job of the ego is to reinforce its existence. The job of the ego is essentially to, shall we say, keep us safe, to protect us from getting hurt. The ego doesn't want to, so the ego doesn't want to change, which is why we, we resist letting go. We resist change. We resist surrender because for the ego, our sense of self, <clears throat> surrender, letting go, the new possibilities, adventure, going into the unknown feels like a death to this sense of me. And that's why it's often scary, why we, we, well, we're so resistant to something different because something different going beyond, expanding, feels like, oh shit, I'm dying. Like the, uh, the idea of me that I'm holding on to, that I got so sure about from a very young age, feels like I'm dying. And so like, okay, when, when we're children, we'll kind of break it down a bit more. When we're children, we're born free. If you look at a child, a child is free. A child is, let's just say a child doesn't really have ego. <clears throat> they don't have this sense of, you know, this is who I am and I, I am what I am. And, child is just being their pure essence. They're in touch with their infinite expression. They're in touch with their divinity. A child, you know, it's like when you look into a child's eyes, they they don't know what's right or wrong. They're, they'll love you with a big hug and, 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 and just greet you with such openness and, and they're not closed and they'll run naked. They're not thinking about shit. Do I, what do I look like on Instagram? Am I fat? What do you think? They'll still jump on the table and they will sing at the top of their lungs. They don't, they don't care, is it good? Is it right? Is it wrong? They don't understand the, those, those concepts yet. They haven't been conditioned. And so as, 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 as these young beings, we don't really have ego. We are, you know, and as a result, we're living in the flow. We're following our curiosities. We're allowing life to lead us. We're living, shall we say, to a degree, we're living surrendered to whatever is happening. We'll cry. And then we will get over it in the next second. Then we'll poop. And then we're not sitting there going, shit, I pooped my pants two weeks ago. What's wrong with me? We're just, we're on to the next. We're living in the moment. So to me, this is a, a, a kind of flow that we're in. And so what happens is we begin to get conditioned. We incarnate into this human experience. And as we incarnate into this human experience, we're born into like a preset framework of conditioning based on our, we mean our parents, their condition by their parents and their traumas and ancestral karma and conditioning gets passed down ancestral patterns. So now we're born into a preset framework of conditioning, parents and ancestors, culture, society, media, religion, on and on. And maybe our parents, you know, and our parents, they're just doing the best that they can do. But maybe our parents, maybe there, were, there was alcoholism, maybe there was addiction, maybe there was abuse, maybe, you know, physical, mental, emotional, maybe they were fighting all the time, maybe they, were, they weren't present for us, maybe they were great, but they just weren't uh, able to emotionally meet our needs. So a couple of things happen in terms of the, shall we say, the creation of ego. The first thing is we learn to shut down disconnect as children you know we see we're, we're experiencing some level of pain so we learn to shut down disconnect and not feel shut down disconnect not feel shut down so we suppress the feeling suppress 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 uh, and before you know it our light our full expression our 
essence kind of gets hidden or clouded or covered up underneath layers and layers and layers of unprocessed emotion that build up over decades from childhood. And we also learn all sorts of, shall we say, defense mechanisms, strategies. We erect walls around our heart. We disconnect from our emotions. We become so overly analytical so we don't have to deal with our feelings. We develop all sorts of defense mechanisms in order to not feel the pain of what's going on around us, survival. We hold so tightly to this defensive way of being that it worked for us when we were five, but often this way of being that we learned in order to not feel that pain, we take into age 10, age 15, age 20, age 30, age 40, into a relationship and we're still doing that thing. And we hold so tightly to that defensive self-defense mechanism and that holding on positionality is ego. And, and so... That holding on is a form of control to never get hurt again. And all of a sudden, we're now 25, 30, 40, and we end up feeling a bit limited because we fall in love, as an example. Like, oh, I'm in love. But now, oh, shit. No, 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 no. I can't really open up because I never want to get hurt ever again. And so that's why the ego seeks to control. We learn to control. But that's where the ego seeks to control everything, you know? Like, if I can control th this and that and that person, this situation, I'm never going to get hurt again. I'm never going to feel that helpless again. I'm never going to feel that abandoned again. I'm never going to feel that pain again. And so we also learn a strategy to get love, validation, and approval. The sense of like, oh, who do I need to be in order to be loved? Oh, I don't know about you, Brian, but for me, as a kid... <clears throat> You know, my father was a minister, a healer, had 300 churches. And so there was a lot of responsibility for, on me as a young boy. And I had to grow up very early. So for me, it was like, well, I learned to be very mature, very appropriate, very, you know, kind, very pleasant, very, you know, never get, got into trouble, never did the bad thing. I took care of everyone. I was the perfect son, you know, happy all the time, which was nothing wrong with that. But there was also so many parts of my own, you know, emotions of my own childhood that I disconnected from. There was so many, so many aspects of myself I betrayed in order to get love, validation and approval. So we learn to become a person or a version of ourselves that we think is going to get us love, validation, approval. We betray parts of ourselves, which is suffering and painful. And we then... You know, so we develop roles and personas and masks and we think, no, this is just, I'm independent, I'm, this is just who I am. And we then contort ourselves into a shape in order to, to avoid this pain, get love, validation and approval. We hold so tightly to this way of being and we think this is who we are. But this pattern of conditioned, you know, responses that we've learned to become isn't who we really are. It's just a process of conditioning. So I think we have, to, and, and that holding on is ego. It's the process of holding on. It's not, it's not what we really are. It's not who we really are. It's the process of identification and conditioning that we hold so tightly onto. And then we go through our entire lives as this pattern, wondering why, why do I, why do I feel so much love in my heart that I can't express? So now we, you could say we're in our own way because we're holding so tightly to the version of ourselves that we've learned to become out of survival. And if we can understand that it's just a pattern of conditioning, and if we can understand that we're programmed, that it's a pattern of conditioning, if it's a pattern is changeable. And then if we can understand the why we hold on, why we resist, why we're effectively in our own way. It's not because we're bad people. It's not, be, you know, many times we end up judging ourselves and beating ourselves up so harshly because, ah, what's wrong with me? Why am I self-sabotaging? Why am I procrastinating? Why am I, you know, being that way in relationship? Why is my heart not open? And we kind of beat ourselves up. But that just reinforces the holding on. That just gets us more in our own way. And that reinforces the very pattern that we're trying to shift. That reinforces, shall we say, ego even more and drives the pattern even deeper. <clears throat> so if we can understand that we're conditioned and understand what's underneath that conditioning, which really is the drive to protect ourselves, and what's underneath that are all the sort of unfelt feelings and emotions that we've learned to suppress, ultimately levels of fear, then I think it frees us up to be able to 
maybe meet ourselves with some compassion, meet ourselves with a moment of grace and mercy. Because if we're able to then observe this patterned, conditioned version of ourselves that we've become, that we thought we were, but now we're realizing that we're not ego, and we understand, oh, I'm not that, and we can step back and begin to observe that, like, oh, I see what I'm doing. I'm doing this dance. You know, we all have a dance that we do. I'm doing this dance. But for the first time, I can step back and observe the dance I'm doing. And if I can observe myself, if I can observe myself, or if I can observe something, then I'm not that. Because up until that point, for most of us, we're so conditioned in it that we think we are that. But if we can step back and start witnessing and observing those patterns, there's space. When we're not free and we're in our own way, there's no space. But when we can start stepping back and we can observe, oh, look at this dance, look at this, look at this thing, then there's space. In that observation, in that space, there is a moment and possibility for some freedom. And then in that space, if we're able to meet ourselves with the compassion of like, yeah, of course, you know, I'm just trying to protect myself by procrastinating because I, I don't want to put myself out there and be rejected. I don't want to put myself out there and fail. So the pattern of protection is to procrastinate, to busy myself, to not take action. It's not bad. And then when we can meet that fear, really, with loving and compassion and understanding and hold ourselves, those patterns, with that space and context of empathy and compassion, like healing is the application of loving to those parts of ourselves that are hurting. And so the, the, our relationship with ego is more important than ego itself. Our relationship with ego. And so when we can hold ourselves with that compassion, it's like, I see, I see why I'm doing that. I see why I'm in my own way. I, I see what I'm trying to do. That, 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 that space is part of what is actually healing and can allow that part of us that is in our own way to begin to relax and then soften and then slowly surrender opening can start happening because we start we start meeting ourselves with with loving and compassion and so ego is not the enemy as we've been taught ego is not the problem ego is just a a vehicle it's a vehicle that in this 3D lifetime, it's a vehicle that, shall we say, the soul uses to navigate in this human experience. It's the vehicle to drive around. And so we all have an ego. Even, you know, Mother Teresa or Dalai Lama has an ego. If we met Dalai Lama on the street, we're a supposed enlightened being, right? I haven't met him, but I think we all have a level of respect for Dalai Lama. If we met him on the street and we said, hey, Dalai Lama, he would probably turn around and say, yes. And, and so in order for that to happen, there has to be ego. And so it's, but, but I would assume, or I would propose that likely his relationship with ego is more spacious, right? His relationship with ego is more loose, more spacious. And so there's more freedom. But for instance, if he so identified himself with the Dalai Lama as the Dalai Lama, it, you know, like, yo, do you know who I am? I'm the freaking Dalai Lama and you need to bow down to me because I'm the Dalai Lama. Why, why are you not greeting me and bowing? You know, it, like, like then, <laughs> then his, his identification with ego as the Dalai Lama would be very limiting. And, and so ego isn't good or bad. It just is the vehicle. It's neutral in its right relationship with it. That is key. Anyway, I could, uh, let me stop there. That's, there's so much there, Kush, and that removal from ego is something that's really helped me in terms of looking in, and I do the kind of mental trick of, you know, if this was somebody else and you were offering advice in the situation, what would you say? Nice. And straight away, you can see that you're acting in an ego, but something I've really struggled with in your book, book podcast, more so, because I'm an audio listener, I'm loving Soul ah. Talk, but bringing awareness to surrender, something I have really struggled with personally, and I know a lot of people listening are the same. Mm -hmm. You mentioned their love value validation and approval do you think that and again take this in whatever direction you write you want i might be going completely left field with it but in terms of the first step to surrender do you find that that removal from love validation and approval is the first step towards working towards your ability to surrender or something else yeah i think let me think about because i just want to be practical for people 
I think one of the first steps to surrender, you could say, is acknowledging that you're not, <clears throat> you know, is acknowledging that you're not surrendered, acknowledging that, just acknowledging where you're at. It's like, shit, I'm not surrendered. And, and it's okay, you know, it's like, it's, it's the process of being human. 99.9999999999, you know, percent of people aren't. And life, this is the process of life. And so uh, what I want to say also is that we have to be careful when we talk about surrender, a little bit careful, is because sometimes, you know, especially a spiritual, you know, I don't want to say spiritual achievers, but spiritual committed, spiritual folks, we're like, okay, surrender. Okay, Brian's talking about surrender. We're going to surrender now. We're going to like, and, and so we have to be careful that the ego doesn't hijack this concept of surrender with the good intention to surrender. But like now we, now we start trying to control the process of surrender and get even less surrendered. Like hurry up and surrender, you know, and that becomes another sneaky trap to take us further away from surrender, right? And so I think part of surrender in the beginning is just acknowledging that you're conditioned, acknowledging that you're not surrendered. Because many times we don't even know we're conditioned. We're in, we're in denial. We're not even in denial. We're just unconscious. And that's not bad. We've just been programmed and we're living what we're living. So how do we know that we're not even surrendered? We're just, I'm just anxious, Brian. I'm just stressed. I'm just a stressed type A, stressed, frustrated personality. It's just me. And so we don't even know that we're not surrendered. We just think this is who I am. And I'm just saying, you know, I think we have to start asking ourselves, is who you are who you really are, or is it just who you've been conditioned to be? Because the degree to which you're conditioned is the degree to which you're not free. But 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 we never we never question ourselves. The ego never questions itself because the question itself for the ego is the beginning of death. And so the ego doesn't want to question because the moment we start questioning, it's like, oh, maybe, maybe there's a different way. Maybe I'm not who I, or who I am. Whoa, 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 whoa. And so the ego holds on, doesn't want the question, doesn't want the change, doesn't want things to be different, which is why we hold on. And so realizing that maybe we're programmed, realizing that maybe we're, we're actually not surrendered, not judging, but I would even say as a first beginning step to, su to surrender to the fact that you're not surrendered even. You know, to actually surrender to the fact that, okay, I'm not surrendered right now. It's okay. Like, I'm not surrendered, <laughs> you know? And, and, and even just, that's a deeper level of surrender. Like, the issue is not the issue. The issue is more your relationship with the issue. That's more the issue than the issue itself. And so when you can just acknowledge Meet yourself where you're at. That's a level of surrender versus I'm not surrendered. I'm not surrendered and I should be. <laughs> now we're like even more unsurrendered than before. But if we can just start with, I really am not surrendered. Okay, I'm not surrendered. Let me, let me just be with that. And, 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 and let me just, with awareness, right? With awareness, not unconscious. With awareness, be with the experience that you're having, which is, I'm not surrendered right now. And, and something often happens when you can really just be with your experience as it is. When you, then there's no like, I'm not surrendered, but I should be surrendered. And I'm not, so, and I should be, and, and, and the ego loves a fight. But if you can just be like, okay, I'm not surrendered. Let's be with that. With awareness, not unconscious. Let me just be with, I'm not surrendered. And, and, and see see what's present. And I think that's that can be a beginning to just come into a level of acceptance with where you're at. And that can begin a process. So there's, there's a few phases of surrender that I can share too, as, as stages, if you want. I was going to ask, and it's a kind of a short question that's going to lead me on to another question from the book. Do you see surrender and control as two opposites ends of a spectrum, or is there something else in between or something else on a further side? Because when I think of, and the reason I ask this question, because in chapter three, you talk about, and the quote I'm going to pull out is, in our desire for control, we often end up controlled. And I find when I'm trying to surrender to something, as someone that's lived that story of type A personality, I'm just an anxious person, inverted commas, you know, 
that's the it, it you want you want to attach to the story and the label and it makes you feel better that you're like well i'm anxious i'm type a that's fine that's who i am and then I am. my and i spent years trying to let go of that identity just mm. to bring my anxiety levels down but when i would try and control and then attach to it i found my anxiety went up very similar to what you said i know that i should be letting go i should be surrendering to this i should just let him be what be but the more i didn't feel that way and the more control I try to put in it, the more anxious I felt. So I'm curious, just before we yes, get into, yes. co- yeah, control and surrender, do you think they are two opposite sides? Sometimes I invite people to hold on tighter. It's like explore that. I'm, yeah, I'm so, cu- like, like because we're like, well, I should, I should be letting go. I shouldn't be anxious. I should. No, hold on even more. Because here's the thing: every, 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 every emotional feeling has a cycle. So the the truth is, you can't hold on forever. You know, so, so if you hold, you can't like breathe in forever, like you're breathing in, but I should be breathing out. Keep breathing in, breathing, breathing, breathing. At some point, <laughs> you have to exhale, you know, at some point. And so sometimes, it, this is what I'm saying, like meeting yourself where you're at. It's like, but I shouldn't be anxious. I, I shouldn't be. And now you're just like getting more anxious about not being anxious. And so when you can just, with awareness, be like, I'm anxious. This is where I'm at. And so, okay. Hold on even more. Like, like, let's just hold on even more. There will come a point where it shifts. And so because then there's basically, there's no resistance. There's no resistance. So even the, even the idea of I should surrender can be a resistance to where you're at. And that's another kind of subtle level of like, I should surrender and I should be surrendering. And now I'm getting anxious about not surrendering. And now there's this fight versus, no, let me hold on. Not unconsciously, right? As an excuse, but like, let me hold on and fully embrace that I am freaking holding on right now. And, and like, fucking exaggerate it. You know, like, really, but, but you, you're aware, but let, let me like, you know, like I'm angry. I'm kind of like on a. Let's imagine you're like on a scale of five of anger. I'm like I'm angry, but I shouldn't be because I read the Magic of Surrender and he said like you know let go of anger. But I'm fucking angry, and, but, but I shouldn't be. It's like no, like blow it out. Like like let like let's have a moment and fully experience your experience. You will find that if you fully experience your experience, usually that will pass and dissolve naturally without suppression. And that's a level of surrender, you know, with awareness. I've done that where I've, one of the funny you mentioned there about conditioning, one of the things that we weren't really conditioned to feel as kids and teenagers, etc., was anger. So anger. anytime I ever felt that emotion, I suppressed it. Yes, and I yes. spent the last four years between therapy and reading different uh-huh. books and conversations, trying to feel that emotion that, was may as well have been trying to speak Japanese in right. terms of trying to feel feel the emotion. And it's wow. incredible how conditioned you become to not feel to, to, to certain not emotions. Feeling, to, to not feel it. It's like, mm. uh, you know, and so sometimes it, it's, sometimes it's not, this is going to sound weird, man. Sometimes it's not even about like making yourself feel it. Because sometimes when you attack it, like make yourself feel it then the defense mechanism of the ego kicks in even more Mm -hmm. because if we can understand that like beautiful intention of of of, of, let's say your defense mechanism that learned to not feel it for a reason you know and so when you try to override that bodyguard security system it's like red alert it kicks in and and sometimes disconnects even more it's like (laughs) you know excuse this analogy but i think this will make a point if you ever tried to shit and you really needed to take a shit and you're like, I, I need to take it. And you're like on the toilet, really trying to shit. And it just, anyone had that experience, right? Excuse me for the graphic thing, but you will definitely remember this conversation. And you're on the toilet trying to shit. And you're like, Arr! it's not happening. But if you notice, you just kind of give up. Either you relax and just hit, hang out for a moment. It, it, you know, it flows. Or you're like, you know what? I'm going to go about my day and just live my day. And then a moment happens a few hours later when it, you're like, oh, I'm ready now. You stop resisting. Like, 
rather than trying to make yourself do something or feel something, you accept this, this, this is where it's at. And that acceptance, you know, it's not a giving up, it's not a, an abdication of responsibility, but it is, it, it's like an embrace of where you're at. Then, you, then it allows you to just relax with where you're at. And you'll find that then that defense mechanism has, you give yourself nothing to resist. What you have to understand is the ego, it wants a fight. Ego wants a fight because that fight is what keeps ego in existence. It, it, it gives ego something to fight against, which keeps it alive, which is why many times we get in our own way, which is why many times we create drama, we, we create, manufacture things, because then that gives us a sense of feeling alive, right? And so, and so when we don't, you know, it's very sneaky how to work with ourselves sometimes, especially as we get to the deeper and deeper levels of working with ego, because how, how you go about working with it is part of the process, not just the thing itself. So surrender, okay, but now we're like forcing it. And that can keep us stuck even more. You know, so when you, when you give ego less to resist, like there's no fight. It's like if someone comes up to you and like, hey, Brian, you're a blah, 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 and, 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 and you're this and you're that. And you're like, well, screw you. And, and now you have a fight, right? But if, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, Brian, you, 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 you podcast this blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay. I mean, well, what happens now? You see, it just, just dull. The energy dissolves. There's no fight, but ego wants to fight because that keeps the, um, the ego alive. I, I don't want to take it too out there, but another kind of layer that can be quite deep is one of the places that ego hides. This is very sneaky. One of the places that ego hides is in spirituality, is in the process of seeking seeking freedom, seeking enlightenment, seeking moksha, seeking liberation, constantly seeking. That can be one of the last places ego hides. The constant seeking for an, another state of being. And, 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 and the reason it's sneaky is because it seems like, okay, we're not in the club and we're not in Las Vegas and we're not getting drunk. So it's like, oh, it's a good thing. But ego, the ego wants to seek and never find. And that seeking is what keeps it in existence. So we just have to be aware, you know, it's, it's, it's really meaning ourselves where we're at. And surrender might be acknowledging, I'm not surrendered right now and that's okay. The energy dissolves. Yeah, there's something you've said there, Coot, that I think for people listening, I've always, very similar to listening to the podcast, reading your books, that association with ego, that's something that you kind of rewired my thinking on because mm -hmm. I was in the good, bad category for ego as yes. opposed to, you know, you speak in a podcast that is like an electrical current, the context matters and it's not good or bad, it's your relationship yes. to it. And an example that I've used for people for feedback is if somebody throws something at your, in your direction, a comment, a hateful comment, you know, this podcast didn't like Brian the way he was on the podcast, don't like Coos, don't like X, yeah. Y, or Z. I would always ask, well, why did it connect and make you feel that way? For mm -hmm. me, I generally find that most things that connect have connected for a reason. And it's just my ego trying to take over because the analogy I use is if somebody says, you know, uh, coot, you're X, Y, or Z, or Brian, you're fat, ugly, stupid. But if somebody else came up and said, Brian, you're a purple polar bear, that wouldn't even, it would just go right off my back. I wouldn't even connect to it because my ego has no attachment <laughs> to being a purple polar bear, but it might have an attachment to being fat, ugly, or stupid. Yeah, and yeah. that can be a trigger word for me. And I think that awareness can be really important. Yes, There's yes. some, I want to pull back. This is a super selfish question because you said sure. something there that re really hit for me mm. about manufacturing things and manufacturing problems. This is something yeah. that I still struggle with to this day as somebody that is healthy and well. Most of my mm. family members, for the most part, are healthy and well. I'm very financially secure. <clears throat> 
secure, I have a job that I love and I'm so fulfilled doing, but yet my brain still manufactures problems and manufactures scarcity and manufactures anxieties. And I'm curious just because you said it there and I actually never thought about that language myself. Talk to us, or can you explore that or, or explain that to me about how we manufacture things or how we manufacture problems? Yeah, I think, I think, and there's so many different directions because there's some neuroscience, you know, aspects here that I won't get into. But, but I think if we understand that the ego's job is to reinforce its existence, then, then in order for it to exist, like ego, let, let's say ego doesn't exist in stillness, which is why many of us, we're afraid to really just be or just be in meditation. Like, like how many of us, like, we know we should meditate, but we freaking don't, <laughs> you know, I've been there. Like, we know we should meditate, but we don't. It's like, well, how difficult is it to meditate? Just sit there and kind of, you know, do nothing. I mean, that's the easiest thing, but somehow we... We don't have the time. We, we busy ourselves. We, we, we run around. We, we're going here. We're going there. Because in motion, friction, motion, ego has a sense of existing. And, and so when we're completely still, another version of that is when life is kind of good. There's no friction. Life is great. Life is amazing. There's no friction, no fight. There's just flow. Ego feels like it's losing its grip or, or it's not in control or it's not doing anything. It's, it's not necessarily being the doer. And so for the sense of our, our, our existence and identity, ego starts feeling like I, I'm not existing. And so I think one of the reasons we tend to unconsciously manufacture dramas, unconsciously manufacture dramas, and, and things to create friction in our life, you know, is, is, is the ego's way of having something to do. Is the ego's way of having something to do so that I can, I can feel that I am, am here. You know, I'm here, right? It's why sometimes, I mean, sometimes we, we over, you know, sometimes we overread because, okay, I'm here. You know, sometimes why, why people, you know, uh, abuse themselves, sabotage themselves. Like, it's painful. I can feel the pain. Like, I exist, you know? And so there's a profound shift that happens when we realize that we are not the doer. But the ego wants to feel like it's always the doer, which is why we get in our own way. And, and one of the ways that we feel like we're the doer is to control everything. And so there's a point where I think there's a quote that goes something like, to not do yet, I think it's like, like Lao Tzu, right? To not do yet in the Tao Te Ching, to not do yet everything gets done. Like that's the flow. But for the ego, it's like, no, that can't be. I have, I have to, like I, I have to be the one. And now we get in our own way because ego wants to feel like it's the one doing it. But, but I think there's a next level of life that opens up in surrender where we really get ourselves out of the own way and we, we merge in the flow of life and we begin to realize that we aren't the doer. Life is the doer. The divine is the doer. God is the doer. The infinite intelligence is the doer. And if you look at the great ones, let's, let's just start with Jesus. This is not a religious conversation, but... I consider Jesus a, a, a man who realized his uh, true self. And Jesus was someone that said, the things I do, you can do these things and more. And Jesus was considered a miracle worker, an enlightened being, shall we say. And he said something really key. He said, it's not I that does the work. This was the secret right here. It's not I that does the work. It's the father in his language, the father, we could call it the mother, the universe, the infinite intelligence, the divine, God, life, you know, source, beingness. It's not I that does the work, it's the father that does the work through me. He realized 
that he, I, little, little, little coot, little Brian, me, personality, was not the doer. It was life. And that was him getting himself out of the way. And life was able to move through him. Life was able to function through him. Life was able to use him. Like he opened, in that surrender, open to the infinite possibilities of life. And life was able to do the miracles through him. And I think that's when we get ourselves out of the way and magic happens. But for the ego, that is very scary. Because we believe ourselves to be that limited form. And we're not. And so in a sense, when we can begin the process of disidentification, which is a kind of death. If we can begin the process of, you know, what Rumi said, you must die before you die in order to truly live. <laughs> you know, that's what he meant, is, is begin to realize that what you really are is not this mind, body, form, mechanism, religion, skin color, you know, Brian Koo, you know, character. Like what you are is beyond birth and beyond death. It's the infinite beingness that is living and breathing you. And this costume that you are as this character is a temporary, you know, appearance. It's not what you are. And so every, I think all the great beings, Jesus, one of them, right? All the enlightened beings. We could go to Jesus, Ramana Maharishi, Nisargadatta Maharaj. I mean, on and on in different cultures had their enlightened beings. They, they realized that they weren't the ones doing it. They were surrendered. And in that surrender, they transcended themselves, the limited small I, and they surrendered and, and merged, relaxed, dissolved into the big I. That big I that we all are, at that level we are one. That big I that you are, I am, everyone is, and everything is that. I think when we can, I mean, that's, you could say, the ultimate surrender, right? When we, when we realize that, then that's the ultimate freedom, you know? That's the ultimate freedom. But for the ego, it's scary. So, you know, I think what we're all doing in some way in this process of life is we're resisting, you know, that surrender and realizing, oh, I, 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 Jesus again, I and my father are one. Pretty simple. I and my father, the infinite intelligence, the divine, the source of all things, life, are one. Boom. That's the code right there. You know, uh, in many times in India, you hear the, 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 the term, I am that, this is that, everything is that, <laughs> we're all that, you know. And so, uh, so, so surrender in our culture is very scary, which is why I think in our Western culture, for the ego-driven Western mind, right, it's like surrender, it's like, F that, I don't want to surrender. It's like we, we tend to run away from that. However, anyone that did anything great, Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Mandela, Martin Luther King, I mean, the list goes on. They all surrendered themselves to life. And they were not perfect human beings. You know, Mother Teresa wasn't perfect. Mandela wasn't perfect. Uh, Martin Luther King wasn't perfect. But in their surrender, they transcended their human limitations and life used them. So what I would love for people to get is you can create and manifest a certain level from the level of the ego. You can. It's possible. Lots of people do it. We look around at the world. But I think you end up living a limited life. It's only in the surrender that you tap into the infinite possibilities. Look at a Mandela. You know, that's a kind of life that you could never plan with your mind. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to spend 27 years in prison. And then I'm going to... That's a mind beyond strategy. That's a life beyond strategy. That's a life beyond logic. That, that is... That life, we can all tap into that dimension of living when we get ourselves out of the way. And so surrender is, I think, the most powerful thing that we can do, truly, to live the next level of our life. Surrender is the most... Powerful is, is, the, is the real secret to manifestation, the real key to true greatness. Not goodness, but greatness. So we have to like give up what is good for what is great. We have to let go of what is mediocre for what is truly magical. And so there's this idea that if you surrender, uh, you're weak. 
If you surrender, you, pa- you, you know, it's giving up. If you surrender, you're going to be a doormat taken advantage of. You're going to have to just move to the Himalayas and be a monk in India. That's not what it is. To me, I'm saying if you surrender, what if you didn't get less? But what if you got more? See, the, from the level of the ego, we've been talking about the ego. From the level of the ego, the ego thinks it knows what it wants. From the level of the ego, we set our goals. And the old ego-based model for creating one's life is all about what do I want? I, the small I, right? We've been talking about the smaller. What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? Many times we, we do mani- manifest what we want or what we thought we wanted only to realize that what we thought we wanted was maybe not what we really wanted. It was just what we thought we wanted based on who we thought we were. And often our goals, I want that Lamborghini. I want that beach body. I want that, you know, fourth million Instagram followers. I want to win an Oscar, whatever it is. Many of our goals are projections of unmet needs from our childhood. We didn't feel enough. We felt unworthy. We felt insecure. So if I can just get that thing, then I'm going to be whole, perfect and complete because we forgot that essentially our true being, we already are whole, perfect and complete, you know? And so those goals often never truly fulfill us because we're coming from what do I want? But we're not asking, which we're beginning to ask, you know, today, who is the I? Who is I? What is, what is I? And so in the new paradigm of, let's say, surrender, it's a different question. And the question I invite people to ask is not what do I want, but what is it, what is, what is life? you know, seeking to express through me? It's not an ego question. What is life seeking to express through me? What is the universe seeking to express through me? What is the infinite intelligence? What is the divine? What is, what is my soul? What is the deepest impulse of what life is seeking to express through me? And to open yourself to that to feel that, to attune to that so that you can bring your personality and your ego, which is a necessary vehicle in this human experience, to bring your personality into alignment with life. Now you are working in harmony with nature and that's when the magic happens. And so surrender is a letting go of control or the the illusion that we're in control. Surrender is when we stop trying to manipulate and force life to fit our limited idea In many ways, from the level of the ego, we want what we want. And we set goals that we get so attached to. Like, it's got to be this way. I've got to be this thing. It's got to be this person who's going to be my soulmate. And we don't realize that in that holding on, because the ego can't see the total possibilities. The ego, because it's conditioned for the reasons we talked about, its perspective is very limited. It can't see the infinite possibilities in the tapestry of life. And so we often hold on to what we think we want, not realizing we're limiting the universe. Like we, we go to the universe saying, I really want this peanut. It's got, I, I want to manifest this peanut. It's got to be this peanut, only this peanut. When life is like, I'm trying to give you a freaking like buffet, but you want a peanut. Yes, this peanut, because we can't see the infinite amazingness of, of what's possible. And that's why even when things, that's why I tell people when things don't work out, sometimes it's a blessing. But we're not from the level of the ego. When we live in the ego, we're in our own way because we can't see what is happening right now. We can't see the gift of that thing not happening, the gift of that relationship breakup, the gift of that failure in that moment and how it fits into the whole. And so it's to let go of the idea of who we think we are the idea of what we think we should be and how we think our life should be so that we can truly be open and available to life. It's in that surrender, that getting ourselves out of of the way, that openness that we're truly available to, let's say, the highest good. Like the highest good. From the level of the ego, we can't see the highest good. We just want what we want, but it's often limited. And so to surrender, to get out of your own way is to, is to open to the infinite possibilities that often we're unable to see. And, and that's when I think life can use us in ways that we can't even imagine. I don't even think Mother Teresa or Gandhi or Mandela could have imagined that life would have used them that way. And I think that's what's available to us. That is what is possible for every single one of us if we're willing to let go, question ourselves, surrender the limit. See, the next level of our life requires the next level of us, but the next level of us requires that we let go of what's no longer aligned. We let go 
of who we were. But as human beings, we tend to hold on. You know, we, we hold on to we hold on to the old out of comfort, familiarity, not realizing that that holding on is blocking our blessing. So I would just ask everyone, what do you need to let go of? You know, what do you need to release? What do you need to surrender? Who do you need to let go of? You know, and, and I think that's that's something that is the magic. Like we all, the book I called the book, the, and I'll say this too: the magic of surrender was not the book I thought I was going to write. Right, and this was not even the book I wanted to write. From my, it's true, true, you know, confession. I Coot had an intention, right, to write a different kind of book. I looked at the market, and I'm like, oh, I want to write a New York Times best-selling book, and. There's the, the magical lot of tidying up, the salt lot of not giving an F, all these sexy titles. I'm going to write a sexy book like that. That's going to be like a, a mega hit and, you know, kind of play on people's, what people want. And, 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 and I was coming up with all these sexy, amazing titles and hundreds of ideas on a, on a whiteboard. None of those ideas felt in alignment, not one of them. The only word that I had wrote on literally hundreds of words on this huge wall was the word surrender. And I'll be honest, I resisted. I, I, I small I, didn't want to write that book. Because when, when I saw surrender and I thought, oh, shit, that, that's the book. I was like, but I don't want to write that book because, you know, we kind of resist surrender, you know. And, and I had to surrender the idea of the book I thought I should write so I could be available to the book that was seeking to be written. And that, to me, was, that's an example of surrender. And I'm so glad I did, because when that happened, so much about my life made sense. So much of the book began to download itself. And I felt so, you know, authentically passionate about the book. For me, it wasn't like a, a marketing gimmick to, 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 you know, to, 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 to market a book. It wasn't a clever. It was, for me, it's a mission. You know, it was in alignment. And I think what I want to make clear is when you surrender, it doesn't mean you're passive. You sit around, do nothing. For me, it's like when you surrender, you align with what's true. And when you connect with what's true, then, then you can bring your ego. Then you can bring your mind, your strategy, your planning into play to fulfill the impulse and the energetic of what's true. Then you can plan. Like then I went into planning and strategy and marketing and what have you and podcasts and you know, then your ego can serve its true function in service to your soul. Yeah. What a powerful way to finish. I cute, I'm gonna go back and listen to this podcast several times because <laughs> there's so much in here that has connected with me as somebody that struggles with that side of surrender and is a constant work in progress i think this is yes. just the way life is going to be for people for me and everybody else and i'm so grateful for your work for your message for what you do i'm so gra grateful you had that calling for the magic of surrender mm -hmm. finding the courage to let go because the impact it's going to have on my life and other people's lives thank is you. just it just opens up a whole world <laughs> of possibility Coot, i can't thank you enough for this for those who want to pick up the books either you are the one or the magic of surrender finding the courage to let go or the online summit that you have coming up or anything else you want to send people yeah. to the podcast social media please do that now sure yeah uh the magic of surrender book is out on paperback go to amazon check out the book um and also you know i did a, a free event for those that bought the book so i'm going to do something special if you buy the book go to www.cootblackson.com forward slash reinvent seminar you're going to enter your name, your email, and your receipt, and you will still give you access to the replay of the, of the live event I did on May the 14th called Reinvent Live. My website, coopblackson.com, as I said, Coop Blackson on Instagram, Coop Blackson on Facebook. Um, and yeah, for those that feel called to go on a, on a deep dive of transformation and healing twice a year, I do an event in Bali, 12 days in Bali. The next one is in July, July the 25th. Uh, www.boundlessblissbali.com and yes I'm doing uh, a very special summit I'm excited about it's called The Surrender Summit www.thesurrendersummit.com it's going to be July the 12th for one week July the 12th we begin 
We dive deep. I'm bringing on some of my dear friends, everyone from Neil Donald Walsh, Barbara DeAngelis, John Gray, Martha Beck, uh, Michael Beckwith. I mean, the list, John D. Martini, the list goes on. And we're going to guide you in the different levels and stages of what it is to truly surrender. So that's www.thesurrendersummit.com. And for everybody listening, I will put all of those links that we've talked about in today's episode and that Kud has given there on brankingfitness.com. You can head over to the show notes on the page and in the link on the description wherever you're listening to podcasts. So go check out the books, check out the summit, check out the Instagram page. And I also personally highly recommend the podcast. Go check out Soul Talk with Kud Blackson. Kud, thank you so much again for your time, for all that you do and keep up the amazing and inspiring work. Thanks, man. There you have it, Coot Blackson on the magic of surrender, freeing yourself from ego and finding the courage to let go. Yeah, one of those podcasts. If this connected with you, I would highly recommend saving it and going back and listening a couple of more times. I've done something very similar with previous episodes with Marble Cats, Robin Sharma, Gabby Bernstein, Dr. John D. Martini, just to name a few. And this will go on to that list as well, where, and Jerry Hussey, actually one of my personal favorite all time episodes that connect with me in a different way every time I listen to it and I think this is going to fall into that category if you enjoyed it be sure to let me know take a screenshot pop it up on your Instagram story you can tag me Brian underscore keen underscore fitness you can tag coot coot blackson on Instagram that's all from me from this week catch you all next Monday